Hello, and welcome to To Health and Back, a podcast about how health, medicine, and wellness decisions from the past help inform us today. I'm your host, Madeline Leggett. And in this bonus episode, I'm sitting down with my best friend and former college roommate of four years, Rachel Priest, to talk about xenophobia and some of her personal experiences this past year during the novel coronavirus pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has fueled xenophobia, specifically anti-Asian sentiment, across the globe, and Rachel has experienced that firsthand. So, Rach, welcome to the show. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell us who you are? Yeah, hey, Mads. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Um, But yeah, I'm Rachel. I'm the content editor at The Bitter Southerner, which is this incredible publication where um, we basically just tell stories of the South, you know, both the good, and there's a lot to celebrate of the South, obviously, and... Also, you know, we aren't afraid to talk about the bad as well. So I really am loving that. And I've been there for about seven months now. So it's been really great. And uh, yeah, I'm so excited to be here with my best friend and (laughs) roommate. We've had, you know, similar, I feel like, you know, we're sitting down and talking about this for for the podcast, but we've also had, you know, conversations throughout the past year about these things as is you know, as they have happened and, you know, even before this too, so. Yeah, I think it, I think it kind of um, says a lot, the, just the fact that we've had this exact conversation so many times, yeah, especially just the past year. So. I know, I mean, it's, it's crazy too to think that, you know, like recently it's been the one, aniver- one year anniversary yeah. um, since, you know, America has, you know, shut down mm-hmm. and since it was declared a pandemic, but I feel like even a year ago we were, again, like having similar conversations and, yeah. I rem- yeah, just it's it's crazy how how much time has passed, but how little has changed in regards to xenophobia. And actually, like it seems like it's gotten worse in some ways. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that's because of more national media attention. But yeah, so I'm so glad that we were able to talk about this and hopefully yeah. you know bring some light to it because I feel yeah. like in some of the conversations I've had with you know family members or um, or other friends or co-workers you know it's other people I feel like some of them have been like oh, I had no idea this was going on which yeah you know I think that for them it's you know it's always easy to ignore things that don't impact you directly and so I think for them you know like it's obviously not impacting them because most of them have been white and so mm-hmm. you know like if they don't have to pay attention or if they you know if it's just not something that they've seen like then they wouldn't know but most Asian people have been really aware of this the past year especially so yeah Can you just give us a little background? So you were born in China, right? Yeah, yeah. So I was born in China um, and I was adopted a couple days before I was one years old. And I grew up in Minnesota and then I moved to Georgia when I was in high school. So that is kind of background. So my adoptive family is, yeah, white, Caucasian. They, you know. Okay. I know we just mentioned that COVID has added even more instances of racism but have you faced anti-Asian rhetoric or attitudes in the past when you were growing up? Yeah, so it's like a really interesting question. I mean, I think on a whole, like, you know, like as a whole, not really, um, just because I think that, you know, their white privilege often protected me. I think that whenever, you know, I was seen with them, you know, people understood that I was, you know, like one of them, you know, like I, I was not seen as Chinese or Asian. I was just seen as, you know, my mom's adopted daughter. And I think that there has been that umbrella of privilege that mm-hmm. I was able to enjoy. Um, I'm trying to think like there was a couple instances in like elementary school when people would make fun of my eyes and stuff like that and, you know, pull them back at the corners, which I was interesting too, because I remember seeing recently that there's some sort of like maybe makeup trend that was going on Mm -hmm. that, you know, like would make it look like your eyes are a little more like curved at the end. And like, you know, the Asian community, people were like, that's not right. You know, it's kind of Mm -hmm. not an appropriation, but I think it's turning in something that has been often seen as setting people apart um, and making it, you know, quote, like stylish for white people to do, um, which is interesting. And it's not that's not just happened to the Asian American community mm-hmm. or the Asian community, but it's also happened to black, you know, black hair yeah. or, you know, nails and stuff like that that have often been seen as, you know, these things that set them apart from their white counterparts. That once kind of white people move into that space and take it over, then it's seen as trendy. Um, right. And so... Kind of going back to your original question, I didn't experience it too much because, again, like I said, I lived under my parents and my family's, you know, white privilege, mm-hmm. but it's something I've definitely noticed post-college is kind of when I really, ha- you know, really experienced a lot of racism against 
me or like or I guess was more aware of it just because again like I was not I was no longer associated with my white family I was kind of on my own and people didn't see me as part of this white family mm -hmm. they just saw me as like an individual and so I think then you know they were able to take their own like preconceived notions or their stereotypes or their fear uh, or stereo you know like all those things and really channel them at me and yeah so I think it's only been within the past couple of years that I've really experienced a lot of it and you know I think we'll get to talking about this later too but I think yeah. it's interesting because I think that for a lot of younger Asian Americans right now they're a, a lot of them are scared not necessarily for them but for their parents mm -hmm. um because there's been a lot of instances of violence especially against elderly Asian people in like New York and California yeah. where there's large concentrations of like, Asian populations and so luckily that's something I don't have to worry about because my you know my family's white and so that is Luckily for me, like, I don't have to carry that burden or that stress being like, are my parents going to be okay, like, walking outside or doing just everyday life things. I think that's my experience and other other adopt other Asian or Chinese adoptees who are adopted by white parents, like, I get it. I think that their experience is different than other, you know, like, my experience is mm -hmm. different in a lot of ways, but also similar in a lot of ways to other, you know, Asian Americans right now. So. Yeah. Okay. So maybe in the past, you know, you faced some microaggressions, like being mm -hmm. called other people's names at work. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. So that sort of thing. Um, and I'm I'm laughing because I know you. Of course, it's not. It's definitely not funny. But no, it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it is kind of funny how often this happens to you, though. Yeah. You know how often these little like microaggressions happen. Yes. Um, no, for sure. But if you're comfortable, can you tell me a little bit about some recent examples of racism or xenophobia that you faced, you know, the past year or, yeah, I guess a year it's been. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I would say that some of them weren't necessarily COVID related, but just mm -hmm. ignorance or racism in general. But I think that in the context of this last year, I think that things that I would have kind of been able to just brush off and be like, they didn't mean any harm by that. Mm -hmm. I think it has carried a lot, you know, more weight because you're never sure, like, is this person saying this because they're ignorant and they don't you know they're obviously their intentions aren't bad but again like within the context of this past year when you're seeing all these headlines and you're reading about all these people who have been attacked like you know questions as ignorant as like where are you from which usually for like you know people that don't look you know american and american in this context being like white mm -hmm. um american you know, people being like, oh, where are you from? Usually they're, tr they're trying to ask about your ethnicity. I mean, that's happened to me twice in the last year. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, both times, I don't think that it was necessarily, like, from a point of malice. Mm -hmm. But, again, at the same time, it does carry this, like, much heavier weight of, like, are they asking me because they're scared of me or because they want to, like, distance themselves from me mm -hmm. or because they want to do any of the things that have happened to other Asian people. Like, you know, I've seen people, are, like, they're, they've been punched, they've been spit on, they've mm -hmm. been pushed you know like all these things so I think that that's kind of been the main you know like some of the bigger things that have happened to me personally so last year I moved back home with my parents for a couple months kind of mm -hmm. as things were happening and my parents live in a suburb of Dallas and the neighborhood they live in is predominantly white you know there's there's definitely people of color there but it's a pretty affluent area um, outside of Dallas, and so... And that's Dallas, Texas, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, okay, sorry, yeah. I, should have, I should have specified, yeah, Dallas, Texas. <laughs> okay. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, like, we would go on walks as a family, and mm -hmm. I have, you know, my parents are white, and then I have three brothers who are not adopted, um, and so they're white, and then it's me and my sister. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we, like, all go out and walk around the neighborhood, and, you know, like, it was fine, we, you know, nothing happened, but one time, it was just me, and I was walking, and these kids who, again, like, these were kids too, so I can't, again, say if this is, like, racially motivated, mm -hmm. but these kids are riding their bikes, and one of them screamed at me, he's like, you have the coronavirus, or he, you know, he was something like that, he was like, coronavirus, mm -hmm. and then he, like, coughed, and then he just, like, you know, r rode away, and I think I was mostly taken aback. Like again, it it just always takes you out of a out of the moment when you again like you feel like this is your home and you mm -hmm. feel like you should be able to live a life like you know my my like I should be able to live my life like my friends or my parents or my brothers and like not have things like that happen to me. So I feel like that yeah. when that happened to me, I was like, you know, like, that's crazy. And I just like obviously didn't respond. And again, like it was a kid, so I was not gonna like scream at him <laughs> or do anything yeah, like that. Right. Um, and so I, you know, I just kept, I finished my walk and I got home and I was like talking to my parents about it and I definitely got like emotional or more emotional than I thought I would. But, you know, like I was telling them what happened and, you know, they were like, well, it could just be something I saw on the internet. Like mm -hmm. I've seen this, people have kind of been doing this. 
Um, which I definitely think is probably true, you know, yeah. I guess, I'm guessing that, or I would hope that it's not like he heard that from his parents, yeah, right. um, but at the same time, I don't think that would ha- would have happened to my, you know, my family or my brothers or, you know, other, other white people, like, I don't think that would have happened, Yeah. and it d- never did happen again, like, that was kind of a one, like, a single instance, mm-hmm. but I think it, again, it just kind of goes to show that it really only takes like one instance and you know after that happened I definitely was like more cautious about like walking around and I was definitely more self-conscious about walking around in my neighborhood and again like that was mostly just like a verbal I I, I don't Mm -hmm. know if I call it attack either like it was just but it was something and that set me on guard and made me super self-conscious about you know the way I looked and yeah yeah so that was that was kind of like the the bigger instances I remember of this last year and Mm -hmm. You know, there was one instance too, and this, again, this wasn't racially motivated at all either, mm-hmm. or not, no, sorry, this wasn't <laughs> specifically COVID related, but mm-hmm. I was talking on the phone with someone, um, I had to get insurance for my car, <laughs> and so I was talking to this person, and we were just chatting as she was kind of filling up paperwork and stuff like that, and I told her my middle name, which is my, you know, the name I was given to me by the orphanage, so it's mm-hmm. Chinese, and this woman you know, I told her, I was like, oh, I was like, oh, I was adopted. Mm-hmm. And she was like, oh, she's like, you sound so American. You know, mm-hmm. and I think like... <laughs> you are American. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, yeah. thank you. Like, yes, I am. Wow. But again, like, I think, again, just in those instances, like, not necessarily COVID related mm-hmm. and not, again, not malicious and not coming from like a, a mean, hateful place. But again, I think it sends out a clear message that to be, you know, quote, like, fully American, you have to be white, you have to have a, a, a European or American-sounding name, mm-hmm. you have to not have an accent, you know, yeah. so, like, all these things that are... You have to fit the mold. You have to fit the mold, and, you know, like, I think that we've had this conversation before, and there's such a movement, too, to be, like, be proud of your heritage and be proud of who you are, like, you shouldn't have to hide these things, which uh, uh, I 100% agree with, but at the same time, it does make it hard, you know, like, if... Yeah. You can be proud of these things, but at the same time, like, you know that you're going to face some consequences, like, whether they're people, like, judging you without meaning you, or whether they, you know, like, I think there's been a lot of studies about even job applications. Like, if you have a, if you have a name that's not, again, perceived as American, Mm -hmm. like, you're maybe less likely to get certain jobs or job interviews because, I don't know, I guess people just don't think you can do the job well, so. (laughs) Wow. I mean, and this is, this sort of goes back to what you said about um, some of these instances not necessarily being rooted in, like, they're not, they're not meant to be malicious, maybe, but I think, and I think this was um, pre-COVID, maybe, or, like, pre-lockdown, but I remember you telling me about this instance where you went to, like, Disney World or something in Florida, and a woman, you know, asked if it was your... (laughs) maybe first time visiting America or something similar like that. Yeah, yeah. It was actually, so we were driving back um, Mm -hmm. and I was with like my small group from church and we stopped at this restaurant and Mm -hmm. this woman, I was standing in line with her and this was, honestly, this was right before the country locked down. So I think, you know, like people knew about COVID and they knew it was coming and Mm -hmm. there was a lot of obviously like misinformation out there and there's a lot, I mean, I think too, like this, thinking back on this time, like even though people had the right information, like, there was mm-hmm. just so many competing narratives about what our country would do and would people even get it here? You know, like, there was right. just so much, like, uncertainty. But this woman was standing next to me in line and she kept looking at me and mm-hmm. I was like, oh, like, obviously on guard because at the time, too, the news was very... Now, you know, national media has been more conscious about saying things and stuff like that. But I think at the time, too, especially under... The leadership of, you know, then President Donald Trump, he was mm-hmm. calling it still, you know, like, and he's still calling it now, like the China virus, the Chinese virus or the Wuhan flu, like all these things. And so again, like I had that in the back of my mind, so this woman kept looking at me and I was like, oh, and so eventually <laughs> I made eye contact with her and she's like, oh, hi. I was like, oh, hi. You know, so we just like talking and I was wearing, I, I don't know if I was wearing like a Georgia sweatshirt, but mm-hmm. Um, she w- eventually was like, oh, like, do you go to school here? And I was like, yes. Mm-hmm. I was like, I go to the University of Georgia. And so we were chatting. Um, and she's like, oh, she's like, well, how do you like it here? You know, like, uh, yeah. as if it was like my first time. And I was like, um, great. You know, like, like I, <laughs> yeah. I've lived here for my whole life. So I guess it's fine. <laughs> Maybe not as fine now. but <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So yeah, stuff like that is just, again, not coming from a necessarily um, malicious place. But yeah. at the same time, like I, you know, mentioned earlier and Questions like that can, you know, they carry just so much more weight now yeah. because of the heightened anti-Asian sentiment and racism that's prevalent really right now. So. Yeah. And I think, I think it's an interesting contrast too, because 
even when you and I went to Nashville, Tennessee last year for spring break. So this was like COVID was happening, but it was pre, it was basically pre-lockdown. So two weeks before. Yeah. 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 So when we were in Nashville, um, we were at some public place, like a restaurant or a bar or something. And it was interesting because there was this certain man or like group of (laughs) men who were trying to make, you know, trying to have a conversation with you. And it seemed, you know, it seemed like they wanted to talk to you because you were, quote, like using his words, exotic or, you know, that kind of thing. And then post that trip. So after that trip, after lockdown, the sentiment completely reversed, you know, so no longer. Well, I'm, again, making a pretty broad generalization, but now it's more like these instances that we're hearing about on the news are rooted in like. Yes. malicious like racism mm-hmm. you know yes yeah that is such a good point you bring up because yeah like during that trip it, yeah it was just, <laughs> multiple <laughs> times actually yeah. now that I'm like thinking back like this yeah, wasn't was a, a one and no, done was a couple times but yeah that instance in particular like yeah I think you know one of the stereotypes or one of the ways mm-hmm. that especially Asian women are viewed in Ugh. this country are you know it's viewed as like exotic and mm-hmm. you know there's a lot of like fetishization that mm-hmm. happens yeah Asian women especially are fetishized Mm -hmm. um and viewed as you know exotic and there's been a lot of like studies about you know where this is rooted and I mean you can again you can trace a lot of these things back to a couple instances and just how they've like grown and yeah but yeah like you said like it's interesting because at that time again like my ethnicity was viewed as I don't know like to to want or yeah you know something like desirable or like something sexy or like, yeah, like erotic and which like is not so, in a good way yeah <laughs> in a bad just, way exactly the worst way because again like you know how did that make you feel when that guy was like that's you know you look exotic where are you really from yeah, you know because yeah. that was the thing he kept asking where are you from where are yeah, you from he kept asking, yeah it was yeah it was, i mean yeah we were both so natalie and i were at, at this i think it was a bar right yeah yeah we were there just got and there's this group of three men was mm-hmm. so gross they kept like three just, white like, men three white men they're just like talking to all these women and then eventually one of them came up to me and he was like where are you from where are you from and I was like I'm from here and I mean Madeline was there too and she was I mean she also stood up yeah. and she was like she's like Rachel she's like she's American yeah she's from here and he kept pressing he yeah. kept asking and, where you were really and from I, yeah and I kept answering I was like I'm American like I'm from the U.S. and he was like no 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 what's your nationality what's your nationality and then finally Madeline was like do you mean her ethnicity? And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, oh. And you know, it was interesting too because at one point he was like, he's like, no, I'm, he's like, I'm German, I'm like English, I'm French. You know, mm-hmm. and he was like, he, again, like he just didn't know how to like verbalize it in the, you know, quote, like correct way. He also described himself a self-described wasp. Yeah. So white, Anglo-Saxon, yeah. Protestant. Um. He did do that. <laughs> Yes. So again, like to your back to your point, yeah. it is just interesting to see how they have flipped. And and I think that something that Madeline and I have discussed is, you know, I would say that Asian people and the stereotypes about Asian people in this country are not necessarily they're not as harmful mm-hmm. physically to mm-hmm. like Asian people uh, until recently. Right. Before COVID, like they weren't necessarily, you know, like I think that again, like Asian stereotype is that like we're smart, mm-hmm. we are doctors and lawyers, and it's interesting too because... Um, good at math. Yeah, like, good at math. We talked about that before. Like, all these things, and um, that they're hard workers and all this stuff, and it's interesting too because on the TikTok... On the TikTok. <laughs> on the TikTok. I, okay, that makes me sound so old. On TikTok. <laughs> um, there was this video that was circulating, actually, that I saw, and it was this, like, white man, maybe he was in his, like, 20s or 30s, and he, oh. he said... Let's see, his his line was, let's see, let me find it. Okay. If America is so racist, why are Asians the highest earners in America? Which, again, just goes to prove that these stereotypes are still being perpetuated and still being believed in. And, you know, I think I've said this before to Madeline and I've talked to some other friends about mm-hmm. it, but being Asian in this country hasn't always necessarily meant the same things as being, you know, black or Latino. Yeah. Like, you know, like, we're not stereotyped as dangerous necessarily or as undocumented you know like yeah. all these other like may- definitely more harmful like physically harmful stereotypes before covid but not i mean physically harmful but still like harmful themselves you know like yeah. just because we're not being like we're all dangerous it doesn't mean like that these stereotypes still impact the community and impact the way that kids see themselves or all you know yeah. so many other things so it's crazy 
Wow. Well, yeah, I know this is a huge question, but um, I mean, what's the answer? How should the U.S. tackle xenophobia? Uh, it's a big question. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Um, you know, I I think just it's a good question. Let me, let me yeah. Think okay. <laughs> and we can come back. We can come back to that too. But I know, like, I know you had said you said something about how the national level yes. communication could okay, have. yeah oh and yeah. actually that brings me to another point that i wanted to mention the quote unquote china virus yes so let's why don't we actually take a little bit of time if you have it to yeah. address that because yes i mean i'm still like just flabbergasted that anyone still uses that phrase um yes. But for example, you know, when you heard former President Trump say, you know, describe COVID-19 as the quote unquote China virus, I mean, what was that like for you? I mean, I think, again, it just, it just puts a target on people's Mm -hmm. back and it just makes people be like, well, this is must, this must be their fault. You know, like Mm -hmm. if this, if not only are people just kind of saying this, but if the president, again, then president of the United States is like calling it the Mm -hmm. China virus, like I think it gives them license to really target Asian people. And mm-hmm. I, so I, last year too, I read a story from my capstone class mm-hmm. about uh, anti-Asian sentiment. Yeah. Um, and I think the thing too is I, I interviewed, st- like as for students, I interviewed three students, three college oh, students. Yeah. And one of them was Chinese. One of them was Korean and one of them was Filipino, but they all experienced racism because of the way they look. And I think that's something too that's dangerous is because I would say as a whole, white people really can't tell people, mm-hmm. people from Asian, Eastern Asian countries apart. And so all these people get really lumped into this like conglomerate of like this person, they must be Chinese. And so therefore we must, you know, say yeah. something or like do something, you know, like all these things. And, yeah. you know, going back to your original question, like I, again, like it just hurt to have him say that. And even after reporters brought up to him a couple of times or like, mm-hmm. you know, and I remember watching a press conference where this reporter was like, oh. you, yeah, like yeah. this reporter, you know, was saying they're like, you know, President Trump, like, mm-hmm. there has been a rise against, you know, the Asian American, a rise in violence against the Asian American community. And mm-hmm. again, this was back in 20, 2020, like back yeah. last March, April, May. Um, they're like, do you think that calling it the, you know, the China virus, mm-hmm. Chinese virus is like dangerous? Like, and his response was like, no, like it comes from there. Why would it be dangerous for them? Which again, just goes to show his ignorance. And, you know, even recently he put out a statement Mm, as like yeah. a, you know, a private citizen now. <laughs> and he still called it the China virus. You know, he said COVID-19 and in parentheses, he said... Okay, so he sent out this statement on March 10th of this year. And he said, I hope everyone remembers when they're getting the COVID-19 and then in parentheses, often referred to as a China virus vaccine. And then he, you know, went on with the rest mm-hmm. of his statement. Again, that just goes to show that even now and even with more national media attention surrounding, you know, the violence happening against the Asian American community here, he still is persistent on calling it that and perpetuating that harmful, I don't even know, like, this, I don't know if stereotypes the right word, but just yeah. like the harmful rhetoric around COVID-19 and again, just really putting a target on people's backs. And so yeah, that's how that made me feel. And I think going back to your original question of, mm-hmm. you know, what can America do, uh, you know, what, what can this country do to protect Asian Americans or, you know, what can we do to get rid of xenophobia, which... Yeah. You know, again, I speak from, like, my own experience, and I speak as one person of a whole community. And so, but I think that it starts really at people advocating. And again, like, also more national media attention. I think that historically, at least from what I've seen, the Asian community in America has been really underreported. I think there's a lot of issues in media. Like, I think I think we both can both discuss this, and obviously we both work in you know, like the media, which is a very yeah. broad, you know, very obviously broad statement. Yeah, I mean, I think just like more attention about it and or more attention surrounding it, more coverage of those instances. And also, again, like not only attention, but making sure that people are held accountable for the things they do do Yeah, um, is really important and not, you know, like not just brushing it aside as something that like is harmless or something that is... Right. A joke, I think, to like something that I yeah. remember remember hearing. You know, early like, the, one of the first questions you asked me mm-hmm. was, "What kind of experience did I have growing up?" Oh yeah, right. Um, and I think that there's something that happened then, and I, I think still happens today mm-hmm. among adults, is that you know, like, when something happens, when something happened to me when I was younger, and like 
you know, kids were pulling back their eyes or like mm-hmm. pretending to speak like Chinese, Ugh, whatever, you know, God. whatever that is and yeah. saying like syllables, they, sounded, they thought sounded like Chinese. Yeah. You know, if I was like, that's mean or like, you know, they'd be like, well, I'm just joking. Like, that's Ugh. just a joke. Like, like can't, can't you, you take a joke? Yeah, can't yeah. you take a joke? And I've you know, like, that. I think that's so toxic and so dangerous yeah. because it not only belittles like how they're feeling about the situation, but again, like it help you know, like it makes it okay for this person yeah. to do it under the guise of like being quite like funny. Yeah. And I think that as we're going forward, you know, making sure that you do call those things out. Yeah. Um, and you call them out among kids, you call them out among adults, you call mm-hmm. them out among, you know, things that happening in the news. Or you know, like yeah. and you just again you just like hold people accountable for their thing you know, like for their actions and not again like bury it under like they didn't mean it that way or they were just making a joke or this is just one part you know like again like i think that there's so much more attention that can be brought and should be brought to make sure that these things don't happen anymore because it's not okay and um, yeah and i mean okay so something you mentioned like you you just mentioned it but um how do you think that people like me could be better allies to the Asian American community during this time? You know, just speaking from, I guess, your point of view and perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think that... No, again, I think the first step or the first... You know, like, the the easiest thing someone can do is just, like, stand up for their friend or their family member or whoever they're with. Or even if they're not with someone and you just see this happening, just, again, like use your privilege to speak up on behalf of other people and yeah I I think that's the easiest thing and I think that's like something that you know we've talked about a lot and something that again like you've done incredible you know like again like (laughs) going back to like the bar situation like I'm like Madeline is there you know she's standing up and she's like she's told you this like you're not (laughs) asking the right question like if you're gonna be racist you like might as well like yeah I think that's actually exactly what I said (laughs) you might as well like ask like the like the right question yeah you might as well use the right like phrase <laughs> yeah the right terms. language terminology yeah. um so i think again like it start. it's easy as that um and obviously there's been a lot of media attention surrounding like the bad things that have happened towards asian americans this country you know like last spring there was that family that was stabbed yeah um and like you know recently there was a woman arrested for coughing and pepper spraying an Asian Uber driver in San Francisco. There was another woman in New York who was spit upon with her baby um, and called the Chinese virus. Mm -hmm. Um, There, you know, there's, again, there's been so many instances, but I think also too, there's been, you know, a couple of great stories of like communities sticking up for their neighbors. Like I was reading this story of this family in, I believe it was in California. Mm -hmm. um, And it was like an Asian family in this neighborhood, mostly white neighborhood. And they kept getting, like, random people, like, these teenagers would come and, like, knock on their door and, like, throw things at their house and stuff like that. And this, fa- you know, this community kind of banded around this family and they would, like, sit outside and, like, watch, you know, like, w- like oh, uh, basically I see what you're just, like, they just, like, sit outside on their lawn um, to, like, kind of, like, make sure that these people weren't being harassed. And yeah. obviously that's not happening everywhere and that's not something that, you know, you shouldn't, like, I don't know, like, it's not, it's not <laughs> happening in your community and then. Yeah, yeah like don't, you can't really do anything about it. But I mean, if things like that happen, like that's another great way to just again stick up. And what people need most of all right now is just support, and you know, knowing that their friends and family care about them and are concerned about them. And even I, one of my friends a couple of weeks ago texted me, and she's mm-hmm. like, "I've been seeing everything happening. Like, I just hope you're okay." Oh, um, that's sweet. It was just really sweet, you know. And it, that just meant a lot to me, knowing that she is someone who is not Asian. Mm-hmm. you know is, is aware of what's happening and wanted to check on wanted to check in on me and wanted to make sure I'm okay because I think that something that I've you know really talked about and you know have had experiences with this especially with you know me being Chinese and being adopted by a mm-hmm. white family I think that it's easy for my family to be colorblind and not in like a bad way but mm-hmm. you know just see me as like their cousin or their yeah. granddaughter which is fine, you know, like, it's just mm-hmm. good, and I'm glad they're not, like, being, like, you're different because you're Chinese. Right. But at the same time, I think that in a lot of ways it can be harmful, too, because mm-hmm. then if they see me as not someone that's facing these issues, then they they might see it happen to other people, other Asian people, but they're like, oh, like, that's just other Asian people. Like, that right. wouldn't happen to my, you know, my family member because... You know, she's she's one of us, and like yeah, we love the her. one of us. Type yeah, thing. yeah. And so I think going back to my point, just checking in with people and standing up for them when you when you see things like that happen. You know, if there's something happening in your neighborhood or something happening to people you know, again, just like standing up or doing what you can to to help them during this time is just super super important. And I think that that is 
one way that you know people can help and i think mm-hmm. that racism is not going to go away yeah you know <laughs> at, at the end of this pandemic and xenophobia is not going to go away it hasn't gone away it's been here for you know hundreds thousands yeah. of years and again also not just toward the asian american community like any really community of color in this country has faced their own sort of you know, hardships because of th- their race and their ethnicity. It can kind of seem daunting sometimes to be like, how, how can I tackle or how can I make this better yeah. for this whole community? And the answer is like, you as a single person can't. But you as a single person can, you know, do any of those things that I talked about, like sticking up for your friend or sticking mm-hmm. up for someone nearby. Like, again, it does not have to be your friend. Like, just being vocal and using your voice or your privilege to really speak up. And again, just doing what you can on a, a micro level. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, as you know, legislation attempts to get passed, like mm-hmm. supporting them, you know, something that happens for most grassroots type of movements is like contact your representatives, contact mm-hmm. your, you know, whoever you need to contact and like, you know, make sure that different laws help get passed so that these things, hate crimes and xenophobia, you know, like, again, these are held, yeah. people are held accountable for what they do. You know, my hope is that once people do, then other people will stop doing it because they know that there's consequences because as everyone knows like what things that happen and against communities of color like i think for the longest time people have just been able to get away with it yeah and so there's not really a consequence but i think that hopefully you know hopefully legislation can be passed and but yeah until then just to you know stick up for your yeah for your asian friends or just like i'm sick for any asian person that you see or check in on them check in on them no yeah so well, awesome. Um, thank you so much for talking with me, Rach. Yeah, no, thanks for and inviting me on your podcast. Yeah. So if you're, yeah, if you're comfortable, where can the people find you on social? Like your professional Twitter? Yeah, maybe, yeah, where pro- can they find your writing? Because I, I don't know if I mentioned, but, or Rachel mentioned, but she's a writer and a freelancer. So yes, yeah. where can the people find you? <laughs> on Twitter, you can find me at RZ underscore priest like a Catholic priest, so (laughs) P-R-I-E-S-T. And um, I have a website too, like my online portfolio where you can find writing and some photography. Um, Actually, I think at the same thing with all the underscores. It's just rzpriest.com. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Rach. (laughs) Yeah, thanks so much, Mads. It was so much fun. This has been To Help and Back. Thanks again for joining me on this health history journey. Tune in next time. Until then, don't forget to rate the podcast and subscribe. Feel free to shoot me an email at healthandback at gmail.com. And I'm also on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as at healthandback. Thanks. See you next time. <laughs>